Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, thanks very much for attending. Um, you've just joined um, AASA webinar number five, uh, the transition back from online learning to face-to-face -face learning. My name is Chris Knapp. I'm um, head of school and professor of architecture at Bonn University, and I've uh, been treasurer of the AASA uh, for the past six years. Um, and uh, delighted to host you this afternoon and our panelists. And just trying to advance my slides, there we go. Um, so this is the, the fifth webinar. Um, it's been a good series. Um, we've had a lot of really great presentations over the past couple months um, in this very unique time. Um, and even in the last two weeks, uh, the world has become even more unique with the things that we've been seeing happen in the United States um, uh, in the wake of George Floyd and seeing the repercussions of that around the world and here in Australia. Um, it is certainly a very interesting time to be alive and to be a human being in our society. And um, here we are as architects, also just trying to figure out how to do what we do best um, under these circumstances. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting time to be having this um, transition uh, webinar. So I'll just start off by introducing today's panelists and then talk a little bit about the, um, let's say the, the ground rules or the protocols for the webinar. Um, and then we will get straight into things. So uh, first I'd like to thank um, Brooke Jackson and Joe Kinneba from UTS uh, for running our first um, presentation. Brooke Jackson is an architect, scholarly teaching fellow and acting course director in the School of Architecture at UTS. Her research area is policy and intimacy, which interrogates the legislative prescription of domestic space versus the specificity of domestic life. And Joe's teaching and practice focuses on concealed and marginal spatial histories as sites of potential resistance to dominant narratives of place. Through practice-based creative work, she relates contemporary spatial and performance design to larger political and socio-historical contexts of colonization and erasure. She is also director of education at UTS School of Architecture. Following on, we'll have Tanya Glusek and Francesco Mancini from Curtin University. Associate Professor Francesco Mancini is an Italian registered architect and planner and currently serves as the deputy head of School of Design and the Built Environment at Curtin University. Francesco has taught at the University of Roma Tre, several North American universities and the Cooper Union School of Architecture with Peter Eisenman. Francesco is interested in how design thinking and urban morphology can shape sustainable civic realm. He holds a PhD on Peter Eisman's work from the University of Florence. Dr. Tanya Glusek is a senior lecturer and currently serves as uh, Director of Learning and Teaching at the School of Built Environment, Curtin University. Dr. Glusek holds a PhD in the field of architecture with her interdisciplinary research focusing on the issues of territorialization and re-territorialization in relation to architecture and the spatial perception of migrants. And she is also the AASA Secretary and then last but not least, we'll hear from Sophie Giles. Sophie Giles is head of Department of Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Urban Design at the School of Design at the University of Western Australia. This semester, she has taught a core technology unit involving site visits in the Master of Architecture and an undergraduate design studio. And I also just want to acknowledge Dr. Mohamed Maki, who is a senior lecturer at UTS and also co-founder of Wallacey. And he has been acting as the curator and online learning officer um, for this webinar series. So thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. And I also should just acknowledge um, Dr. Martha Liu, who is the AASA Secretariat, who has also been helping facilitate um, the administration of our um, webinar series. You all would have received invitation emails from her and so forth. So thanks, Mohammed and Martha, and thank you to our panelists. So we'll get uh, rolling here very quickly. Um, each presentation will take about 15 minutes um, there won't be any attendee chat during the presentations. Uh, if you have, do have, have questions, please put them in the Q&A portal as we move along. And following the presentations, we'll enter into a, um, a, a sort of group discussion um, and we can ask specific questions of the different panelists and also more general questions um, for discussion. Um, raise your hand if you wanna ask a question also and, um, and we can try to put your mic on live. Um, we'll try to stop at five o'clock, but um, we may also, you know, just run a little bit um, over time if there's lots of discussion. Um, the session is recorded. It's being recorded right now, and it will be available through the AASA website. Um, the presenter's slides will also be available um, for download as a resource um, from AASA.org. 
Um, if you haven't been to the WSA website, this is um, what the homepage looks like more or less. Uh, it's regularly updated and you can find uh, the resources under our online learning um, projects. So that's enough for me. I think, well, this is the fifth one of these. So most of us already know the drill quite well. Um, so can I please um, ask Brooke and Joe um, to share their screen now and commence the first presentation. So um, we have been given the topic lessons learned from online learning. Birung jadarwa liara gelambamburua nya yara bayugu birung o darwa iara gelambamburua. Gwana yi o nya naba darwa daru yora. I'm just acknowledging and using the local darwa language, um, the country that I'm located on, um, which is Darwa country. I also uh, acknowledge the historical ancestral connection to this place back through time, as well as their continued presence on, on this country, and also acknowledge the uh, other members of the kinship system who share uh, connection to this country, and um, that's the Darug and Eora, that's the Darwa, and uh, others who have um, rights for passing through and using this, this country. Um, and would note that the uh, kind of colonial imposition of one country, one owner has um, caused immense disruption to the nuanced systems of kinship uh, on this country. We've noted here on the slide, please type into the chat box to acknowledge the indigenous countries that you are joining us from so that we can acknowledge all of them given that we're dispersed across a continent and nations. Um, I'd also acknowledge to the um, to our colleagues in New Zealand, Tenakota, Tenakota, Tenakota Katoa, uh, acknowledge that your ancestral houses uh, and uh, you as Tangata Whenua. So we were given this topic on uh, Tuesday morning, or at least that's when we discovered we'd been given the, uh, the topic. So we've decided to do an ad hoc feminist, queer, indigenous reading of this topic. Um, so who are we reading today? So we are reading Dolores Hayden, and from her, we wanted to unpick the conceptual framing of rethinking private life under today's circumstances. Also Donna Haraway and the real-time institutional cyborg, and Eileen Morton Robinson, most certainly looking at reappropriated property. So looking at Dolores Hayden, who has a long discursive history on the gendered nature of roles of the household, we really were probably most particularly interested in um, her concept of rethinking private life and specifically the, the rhetoric surrounding her critique of the neighbourhood strategy. And we're interested in this, um, this conceptualisation which unpicked the idea that the neighbourhood involved the thinking of the reorganisation of the home in industrial society at every spatial level. So what does that mean for us now that we've actually starting to encroach on personal life with the, the focal point of the institution coming into our homes? So we pose the questions, where, did the dem where does the domestic space start and end? And also, where does the institution start and end? Dolores looks at Thomas Jefferson's academical village as a quintessential moment for architecture displaying how to link individuals, households and workspaces. What happens when we're actually forced to involve our home life with our workspaces and also the institution? How do we look at conflating these points? And where does this intimacy line start to unfold in a really new dynamic way? We really are looking at this idea of space here, temporal conflation. And we raise the questions, how do we separate home from studio when my tutor is in my room? And how do I keep my household out of class? And how do I switch off from the academical village? We're propositioning a new type concept, which we describe as the new studio is the domest institutional. And we see that our students are getting very much on board with um, images representation of how they actually are working and what architecture from home actually means. 
we are, think, are rethinking this conquest of private life. And what becomes particularly interesting is that um, we start to un understand that we're actually building up closer in intimate relationships with our students. We're being introduced to their household members, both human and non-human, and we're also being introduced to their household objects, which we're most certainly would not necessarily um, interact with on campus. How do I separate home from university? And most certainly, how do we look at this idea of um, the, the concept of if the tutor is in my bedroom, how do we recognise what that bedroom actually is, formally known as, as we call it? I run a master's studio, which is called Domestic Formalities. And for the first time, we were undertaking this studio from the premise of our homes. We were asked the students in the very early phases of the studio to undertake a series of tasks, analytical um, diagrams of their homes. And this included substantiating the rules and subsets of the governance systems that overlaid into their spaces before and after the lockdown. So we see the prior condition and then the addendum in red. Next slide, Joe, thanks. That's right. So looking back, rule 8.5, once you step on the, the threshold of your room, you must dress and act conservatively. But now we're seeing that the bedroom has now transformed into a public space. This one student recalls I must wear my scarf my mother must take caution before entering my room so that she's not unveiled to my colleagues. We're also seeing a dialogue of um, the non-human kind of imprinting on the spatial construct of rooms and their intersections. Wi-Fi now governs the spatial occupancy of space. And we see that the door and the wall has less impact than the negotiation of Wi-Fi um, accountability and and connection. And from the perspective of the academic, how do we start to think about how we separate home from university when 240 students are in the room formerly known as my dining room? So uh, thinking through uh, the, uh, the readings, we move on to Donna Haraway and um, we talk about how she conceives of the cyborg as a rejection of rigid boundaries. And we're talking about the boundaries between human and animal, but also between animal, human and machine, and also the boundaries between physical and non-physical. The institutional cyborg manifesto articulates a chimeric monstrous world of fusions between animal student and machine institution. The institutional cyborg wears a spatio virtual onesie with slippers and a collar. Um, so just looking at this idea of the separation of animal, human from machine and from physical and non-physical, where all of these things are being conflated on the very surface of the, uh, of the computer. Um, the chimeric monstrous world of fusions between not just animal student, but also academic, whether precarious or less so, and the machine institution. And the spatio virtual onesie we talked about with slippers and a collar might be a shirt over your pajamas, but it might also be the collar of the dogs having a catch up via Zoom too. And we've all had our class degenerate into dogs saying hi, I'm sure. So we think of the domestic space, Wi-Fi, furniture, hardware, stationery, ink, children, dogs, goldfish as pixelated institutional cyborg appendages. Clearly we're having just a bit of fun here. Plug in, unplug. How do we do that? We are private institutional mutant machines. Digital error. Your connection is unstable. Human animal machine error. You're on mute. No, nah, they're gone. Just to have a quick look at a, an example from a class. Here is a project which in which students imagine scenarios um, they're looking at affect and also the material that they're working with in their design studio for a construction subject and then start to develop construction details for it. Ordinarily, we sit next to them in the class and draw with them to help them develop these drawings. But this year has been very different. Um, inspired by Facebook groups for staff of studio teaching, 
Um, we've adapted this, uh, this idea of the tripod taped to a selfie stick with a telephone rubber banded onto it, hanging over a desk where we're drawing by hand. And we've developed our own setups like this to teach drawings. Um, and you can see very much that the contents of your pantry and the, uh, and the spices on your, on your uh, shelf become part of the classroom. Um, also, a kind of screen-based cyborg where sourced images from the internet are, are sketched over, student sketches are um, dropped on top. We're using pencils and pixels, chat boxes and voices all into the, uh, into the one space to help students develop these, uh, these drawings. So what we're actually finding that the students are calling for um, real time if they're not given real space. They're still giving preference for going live for lectures over pre-recorded downloads. And we're also finding that the schedule actually means a rhythm of connection to the last bit of humanity that we're finding within ourselves. The feminist cyborg stories have a task of recording communication and intelligence to subvert command and control. So we've thought about domestic space, Wi-Fi, furniture, hardware, stationery, ink, children, etc., as uh, spatio-temporal com conflations, as pixelated cyborg appendages, but also as reappropriated property. Now, um, we look to Aileen Morton Robinson, um, who speaks of patriarchal possessive logic logics. The uh, for Morton Robinson, the colonial white patriarchy operates possessively. Possessive logics denote a mode of rationalization that produce a more or less inevitable answer. And in a way, you know, our shift to online was absolutely in inevitable and rational rationalized. Um, patriarchal whiteness is thus epistemologically and ontologically privileged, but invisible within its socio-discursive -dis regime, capillarizing through Australian disciplinary knowledges and modern colonial practices. We'd say capillarizing through our homes as, as we... Uh, move to online. Um, some of the ways this has happened, um, this is a slightly chaotic but very real collection of files for students. We've always given them lecture slides but now we're also having to give them recordings of every single informal uh, interaction that we have with them and that they're available for them to download uh, for as long as they have access to the files and then once they have them they can keep them forever and disseminate them as they as they feel uh, they want to. So how does a casualized or precarious academic earn a living from their own IP when the institution records, stores and holds it? How does a casualized or precarious academic demonstrate the value of their own IP to a new client when another institution has shared it in recorded form to hundreds of students and dissemination is therefore uncontrolled? How safe is my IP when students can record live any unrecorded interaction or lecture just using uh, software readily available on the web? How, uh, an example of how quickly and ubiquitously this happened, um, within weeks of lockdown, we had a lecture from Peggy Deemer at UTS Architecture and Immediately afterwards, ah, oh, damn, missed it. When will the recording be available? This expectation that because we record now, we can we can access things was was almost inevitable and a really rapid culture shift. So UTS master students of research cultures were disseminating the studios as proposed by the academics in the masters, and they wanted to actually rip off this. Um, kind of archive of information that we have from recording all the lectures and we're daring enough to ask each of the studio leaders if they could actually have permission for the students to record or re revert to any of the recorded sessions to put on exhibition, which went live on Wednesday night. And this was one of the responses. I guess this is a conversation for Anonymous and I to have in detail. I've erred on the side of caution on those requests because I've had students purposely take me out of context before. When do you need an answer by? Could you supply me more details about the specifics of the submission? If you'd like to see more on this, you can follow the YouTube link from Documents to Discourse via Instagram. Coming back to Morton Robinson's uh, Australian Indigenous Women's Standpoint Theory, um, it provides one way of exercising our sovereignty as an inter integral part of our methodologies. 
To deny differences and to privilege commonalities is how colorblind and power evasiveness discourse operates. So how then does the institution respect the sovereignty of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, Māori and other Indigenous peoples, knowledges, stories, practices, languages and intellectual property? And this is something that's come up with guest lecturers coming in to uh, speak in our classrooms and their, their knowledges and stories are being recorded and kept by the institution. How is cerebral knowledge wrenched from an appropriate cultural context and from embodied experience of knowledge through the thin surface of online and recorded lectures? Um, and then to take Aileen Morton Robinson's talking up to the white institution as our, um, our adaptation of her book, Talking Up to the White Woman, where she does an analysis of Australian feminist writing and her conclusion is that white feminists in Australia accept without criticism anthropological representations of indigenous women. This was in 2000. Uh, and so we would extrapolate and say white institutions in Australia accept without criticism anthropological representations of indigenous knowledges, recorded lectures divorced from cultural context, reappropriated IP of indigenous peoples, and further through precarious indigenous employment in the sector. Uh, and so through the necessity of income continuity, uh, Indigenous peoples are being asked to give up their IP um, for the sake of continuing to earn. So it's Friday afternoon, and in the spirit of a Friday afternoon drink session, we've really just had bits of conversations with these women. <laughs> um, thinking about institutional property as domestic, as personal and as possessed. Um, it's a bit of fun, obviously. We could go much deeper, but Dejari um, Guru on Yun, the two of us, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brooke and Joe. That's, um, I think, certainly going to lead to some excellent discussion um, when we uh, come to the Q&A. Um, if I can now ask um, Francesco and Tanya to share their screens and give us the, the second presentation. Thanks very much. I did. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tanya and I uh, are gonna present uh, the work that we have done over the past two years in teaching different units, in particular focusing on urban design studios. So this presentation is based on the work that Tanya and I did in the urban design research studio methods um, in a master of architecture course. Uh, we would like to start saying that research uh, already has proven that ability to work and design in teams is a fundamental skill for creative professions such as architecture, which requires collaboration across various disciplines and an ability to synthesize the built form from a large number of inputs. Uh, so collaboration is our focus. And so we have explored and tested different ways to uh, maintain the, the high value of collaborative environments in learning environments. They design by doing approach also, which architecture utilizes, resonates with a pedagogy based on experiential learning, which is the other big point we focus on. So for the purpose of this presentation in the current context uh, that is before, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to consider for us learning environment as a combination of factors contributing to student learning. So today's presentation focuses on the insights drawn. Um, oh, sorry, I think I didn't start my video for some reason. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so today's presentation focuses on the insight drawn from the urban studio delivered in 2019, um, pre-COVID, the reflection on the recent online teaching experience during the COVID, which we had taken into account to structure the urban design studio this coming semester. In particular, we have situated this within the glossary of the education reform of learning environment, which refers to uh, learning environment as the diverse physical location, context, and cultures in which students learn. So it's a more expanded idea of learning environment that we're trying to take on board. The term is also encompassing the culture of a school or class, 
It is presiding the ethos and characteristics, including how individuals interact, win, and treat one another. The experience is an essential founding component of a learning center process, as proposed by Devi and Kolb, and it is a process whereby knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. Um, so here we see the calls for stage learning cycle, which consists of concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation. Um, all of these focus on periodically exposing learners to all the, the phases continuously. Uh, in design, this is essential for us, linking each phase with one another rather than prioritizing any of them. This enables students to consider each stage of their learning as part of a continuum which corresponds to their growth in theoretical knowledge, practical skills, creative applications, and lifelong collaborative approach. Kolb's vision of experience presents analogies to the design process, as we said, as it aligns with constructivism, which is our position uh, as a pedagogist, which enables teaching design through the experiential learning theory, taking advantage of a composite and diverse learning environment. In an Urban Design Research Studio uh, of uh, Curtin, we expose students to a face of the learning environment, building on, at the same time, challenging also the traditional learning environment of architectural design units. Uh, according to Lawson, this is normally constituted by studio space, design library, design tutorials run by academic staff, and the design critiques conducted by industry or guests and, and, and academics from other areas. In particular, we challenge Lawson's idea that the traditional 24-7 studio culture is irreplaceable due to the variety of teaching activities and informal interactions among staff and students which stimulate creative thought in such an environment. This has been very, very challenging, particularly when we moved online. The growing reduction of resources in the higher education increasingly challenged the studio structure that was used by most architecture schools for decades to stimulate the typical 20th century office practice. We responded to this problem also asking ourselves, what is the 21st century of, uh, office practice? By replacing the time-consuming master apprentice model uh, through the proposition of a project based on teamwork and experiential and integrated learning environment. The studio offered in semester two, 2019, was run uh, on the premise of, uh, of these uh, principles and was run from the former Perth Technical College in St. George Terrace. Um, in the, in, the city, in, the, in the city center. The pedagogy maintained the core principles of design learning processes consisting of iterative learning by doing rather than through formal instructions. Plus we gain uh, a great advantage being very close to the site of our project. Uh, the main innovation in comparison with traditional studio in this case is the replacement of individual desk critique with emerging collaborative activities distracted from contemporary practice and facilitated by digital tools. So this model allows students to question the design, design problem through iterative propositions of possible solutions while being stimulated by opportunity to immerse themselves in the context they are studying. As I said, the, the site was very, very close uh, to, to our premise there. So this hybrid setting uh, of tools and opportunities uh, comp comprehended uh, a blended real on-site experience and digital learning environment. Students organizing teams of five or six engage in inquiry by design research to support uh, an urban design project through current theories of urbanism and explore integrated sustainable approaches to dense dwelling and urban mixed use, especially at the ground floor of the city. Um, albeit information was shared through digital data, the design process effectively followed very traditional pathway in a sense. In particular, design options were essentially tested through iterative sketching, digitalization, 3D modeling, printing, review, and critique. In line with the uh, government of Western Australia uh, commitment to improve the quality of built environment, a very innovative aspect in, in teaching this unit uh, was to co-design the units with practitioners from Hassel, Element, OGA, the Office of Government Architect, adopting the objectives, uh, measures, principles, and processes which apply to design and assessment of built environment proposals through the planning system. So as said by the Design WA state policy. So we adopted a very uh, much um, real case uh, kind of framework uh, where uh, this offered an opportunity for work integrated learning following a not only practice-based uh, um, uh, 
common uh, best best uh, best practice, but also uh, the format of the design review panel. So these robust industry panels support and engagement, culminating in a successful panel presentation at Hassel uh, office. This year we have involved more actors, uh, focusing on um, the city center of Perth. So we will have with us the uh, historic heart of Perth, the National Trust, the Center for Aboriginal Studies, Development WA, and the city of Perth, um, who will collaborate uh, in shaping the brief of this project. Emphasizing autonomy of student learning, uh, the teaching team uh, progressively is designing experiential and integrated learning environment for the next round, um, following four fundamental points. Uh, engagement with the perceptual experience of the physical built space of the city and its abstract conceptualization as alternative to in-class lectures. Working classroom through the substitution of traditional one-on-one -on -one desk critiques in studio with a collaborative methodology of work. Expanded learning environment by extending the learning design and experience through flipped classroom, engagement and collaboration with this industry through fishbowl techniques, and incremental integration of traditional and advanced digital technology methods, enabling guided access to online information, examination of unit digital resources in real time during design critique. As COVID-19 context has challenged in the implementation of, this, of the first two points, we have leveraged more on digital data and technology to introduce students to site and maintain collaborative environment through online synchronous learning. Social media platforms uh, were essential in, support the, in supporting information exchange and peer review practice. In 2020, the studio will go beyond classroom and will take advantage of this experience. So we will not only recover physical experience of site, it will again be based um, in the city center, but it will also include a wider community of WA and interstate students, academics and practitioners through a live digital platform. In 2019, the student team worked on developing intense didactic learning activities aimed at developing historical morphological and experiential analysis which inform a complete and coherent urban and architectural proposal trying to integrate design at various scales and, and different cultural problems. This is the aim uh, that we have this year too. We want to maintain focus on these, on these values but uh, in a different format taking advantage of our experience and making sure that despite the challenges of the current context we can deliver the same quality. So to this end, uh, students have employed a variety of quality research methods, uh, sites visit, data collection, sketching, drawing, photography, writing to reflect on experiences uh, of the studied urban context. And they produce communicate advanced 2D and 3D design concepts. So we intend to implement this model this semester, but with a big difference that uh, only a section of the core will be in class and sharing that place experience with their peers, uh, um, con which who will be connected online. Uh, and this is something that happens already in practice, but for students it will be definitely a new experience as they went through this semester. For the fourth year, the project theme focuses on the city of Perth. We are trying to build a sort of awareness of the city center as a, as a core area um, for the entire urban region. And after investigating East Perth and the Perth Exhibition and Convention Center precinct, we're now focusing on the adaptive reuse of the Royal Perth Hospital, a place which presents multiple levels of, of significance in relation to colonial, post-colonial and indigenous culture and history. Cultural and health will be the foundations of the brief, aiming to give new life to this part of the historic heart of the city. The idea is that the cultural layer can act as a bridge for those who cannot be physically on site and will be the challenge, but also the opportunity for the group of students who will be uh, unable to, to walk on site and share their experience to transfer this knowledge and the experience that they gain uh, to their peers. To enable a more effective collaborative participatory process to approach the complex large scale redesign of the FPH precinct, it is essential to provide students with a rich collaboration environment for their 3D modeling assignments it's not just a matter of uh, setting a new technique. Uh, we are trying to design a place, a room, as has been said before, where students can actually meet and share in real time their ideas exactly because of um, the, um, the limits that working remotely uh, offers uh, to this kind of, um, of projects.
So to this end, we are working with creating digital technology services in, uh, in collaboration with Intensive Field Lab and Giraffe to set uh, a particular discovery project um, that will be based on uh, the establishment of a server hosting the environment for students and academics, um, which, facilit which will facilitate the implementation and work, and work uh, uh, on, on shared information. So sharing analysis modeling from Rhino Grasshoppers on a single uh, cloud-based platform is, is the aim. And this will help not just to save hours on data manipulation uh, with data-driven uh, drawing, but will enable to um, cross-influence uh, design parameters uh, that can be analyzed and, and, and extracted by all the um, team components and compare for future performance amongst different options. So the idea is to use uh, a, a cloud-based platform to enable students not just to share files, but to share their own experience, their own discussions uh, in real time. Um, as you can see in the left side, the smaller images actually show products, um, uh, students' work um, produced by uh, students who just use Rhino, Rhino on their computers. The idea is to move from the uh, user software as a, as a simple uh, formal tool to a thinking tool, really. So fine-tuning detail of massing setbacks and other urban form, it's the way they happen rather than you know, what they produce that is going to make the difference in the studio. And through specific plugins, of course, we can enable and increase the offer for design criteria, which can be tested and analyzed for different decisions, for design decisions. It is in a natural uh, a sort of a, uh, initial model that aims to, um, to replicate some aspects of the digital twin model, uh, which of course is much more complex, but we want to bring our students into this new uh, learning and working environment. Design options can be seen in context and tested against evolving trajectories of the, of the urban scenario. And this is the first step that they will take and to, into this different world. And to this end, the collaboration with the city of Perth is pivotal because the city of Perth is really interested in establishing a project like this. So uh, doing this way, students will start getting familiar with the possibility to test entirely new precincts, uh, sharing project components in cloud, rather than using usual file exchange practices. It generally happens towards the end of the process and it's more of a you know, of a, of a presentation work rather than a thinking work. The very presence in the city uh, center in 2019 augmented the learning experience for, of Urban Design Studio, which can further supplement it by, through advanced technology. I know my time is up, so I will just um, go to the, uh, to the conclusions. We have used other tools that we, we will definitely um, try to uh, maintain and integrate with this platform uh, to provide students with real-time feedback, which is another important uh, opportunity that new technologies offer. But I think that the main challenge for us is to maintain the level of experience that we had last year that you see here. This is the presentation uh, with the, the pool of guests who were with us in a totally different format as it has been said previously to maintain the sense of community and participation uh, within this process. Uh, this uh, hopefully will allow our students to observe the work of their, of their assessors and their mentors, not just receive feedback. So the level of interaction that we want to provide is comprehensive and the use of technology is aiming to, um, to provide this, this kind of result. And I think that uh, with this, I'm, I'm ending my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Francesco. And we will now move to Sophie. So Sophie, you can mm -hmm. share your screen. Yep. And awesome. I was waiting for Tanya. Sorry. <laughs> yep. yep. And thank you um, also, Tanya. And we will um, um, yeah, follow this up with the with the Q&A at the end. So just a reminder to, to our audience um, to feel free to, to lodge questions. Um, uh, in the Q&A, as well as you, you can um, send comments directly to panelists uh, through the chat as well. All right, over to you, Sophie, thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Chris. And um, look, huge recognition to all um, that, you know, in this, this my third, the third one is entitled Lessons Learnt as well and the Second Wave. Um, but 
really recognition that we all have remarkable experience of innovation, change, methods used, and as a result, it's such an honour speaking um, with this audience. And I think many of us have, have had remarkable lessons learnt, um, not just uh, now and today with Brooke um, and Joanne, Francesco and Tanya, but obviously um, Chris and Mohammed in the past, Frosso speaking about studio, Yolanda about communication, Dave Pigram about making, uh, Stephen Feast's huge experience, uh, Lara McIntosh's site visits, and the amazing Mozilla guy. Um, so I'm still trying to make those virtual spaces. So to that end, I'm going to share a bit of experience about things that um, I've learnt, um, as well to prepare us for uh, multi-mode going on, um, but also potentially for the second wave. Um, I've also asked uh, crowdsourced to the department um, as well. So Clearly, you know, I normally teach techo. I'm on site with students and um, clearly just like Francesco and Tanya's, these were taken, you know, pre-COVID. Um, clearly we made, you know, the uh, very swift change online um, after we had sort of two face-to-face -face site visits um, to then drone videos um, taken by my son that I had to then pay him for. <laughs> so I'm um, 13 year old. Um, as well, obviously talking videos, walkthroughs with architects um, obviously social distancing. Um, and then we also fast-tracked the 4D learning environment. And this was a really um, following on from the amazing OLT grant um, of Christine Landorf and Stephen Ward of um, a number of years ago. But uh, two years ago, my um, colleague Sally Mayo and um, two others in engineering and myself began um, the, well, instigated the process for essentially 550 360 degree photos to be taken um, of a building site um, on our campus and um, it's just come to completion uh, and it's been handed over and so these photos essentially were perfect timing um, just the money to, to get them up was the most difficult bit at the end but um, but really for students to understand that process um, throughout the building so previously they would have been on site um, all together and um, with me obviously learning about you know tactility but with a kind of intensity that a site visit has um, but in this location then it's much more than about compilation from all of those sources and synthesis um, of all of that information so in some ways the you know the speed of the site visit there's so much happening they're taking in so many things and then synthesizing that through one section um, this was then much more drawn out there's sources from everywhere um, but I think allowed some of that same um, interrogation to occur. Um, the other thing we did, and I think some of you already know about this one, um, was the building site bingo, which was, you know, an immediacy of Zoom collaboration that I think we've all come to understand has um, an, an excellent ability to use. Um, and, you know, essentially I was calling out a, a list of names um, of, of things, terminology. I'm not sure why this guy got circled down here, um, but, uh, but, and you know, this was a great way to sort of come together. I think this was our first session together after, um, you know, where we were all from home. Um, as you can see, I'm not entirely in Osaka, which is why, oh, no, in Kyoto, which is why my background is moving a little bit. Conveniently, I'd prepared a whole lot of mini lectures um, previously, um, even one I'm super proud of where I actually walk into the video um, about box cutters and uh, anyway, and so had been using these already and these were just there in LMS, um, essentially the sort of, you know, the known structure of the semester was already there um, and obviously um, my little mini figures weren't dating all that much. Um, the other platform that I've talked about and I think have um, mentioned to some in the past has been GroupMap, um, which is an excellent um, collaborative platform where students essentially learn asynchronously to each other. Um, and this was essentially following each site visit um, for technology. Um, students add you know, two different terms um, with you know, photos and um, links and then can comment on them, can ask questions about them. So instead of me supplying any of this, this is very much the, you know, um, really the, the collaborative learning um, that, uh, that works so well students learning from each other essentially builds a much greater resource than just um, through me. So, um, so potentially less tactile being um, not on site um, and obviously 
like all of you, I think, uh, had students who returned home and students who are still in China. Um, and looking towards the next semester is understanding that I think we will all be multimodal, um, teaching students who are online all the time and teaching students who are face to face. So I recommend group map um, for that. No, no um, pay from them, I promise. Um, as I said, I um, was uh, crowdsourcing from my colleagues, um, essentially, the, you know, what uh, the benefits that have happened. And the one at the very top um, was that, you know, I realised that making can happen anywhere. So this is Santiago, my colleague, with a bit of resor resourcefulness and an eye towards using whatever is on hand. Um, essentially, you know, different students turn up um, when it's online, don't they, compared to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, and also having that, those options of communication. So in the same way that the intensity of a site visit can benefit some students, Really, the, the drawn out ability for, um, to harness information is a different way of learning, collaboratively, asynchronously. Certainly in terms of employability, I think we all agree um, that the students have now confidence in presenting um, in these formats as well. Of course, I think we've all had this opportunity right now that we have Fosso, who's in London, got up very early this morning to, to catch this. Um, but, you know, we've all had guests from all over the world, I think, um, joining us in our final critiques. So um, I was very lucky to have um, Melbourne, Osaka and Singapore. Um, also, the, the ability to draw, um, and I'll just show some examples of that um, via Zoom, I think has been wonderful. Um, and a, another colleague had said that one-on-one -on -one sessions were generally more convenient and comfortable for students once they became used to working from home. Like all of you, I think this is um, my last face-to-face uh, -face studio. It's got really shitty quality, um, but I think we realise it's something about just the moment in time. Um, they're all social distancing, that's what they're doing there. Um, but the sense that, you know, here's our one long street, um, actually in Osaka, let's um, draw it all together while we're all together. And then, you know, over, actually in the end, 15 weeks, um, here's our post-folio party. Um, we did, actually 12 students submitted at that time and uh, a few are in the long tail at the moment. Um, and I did discover how to disappear as well. Isn't this cool? Um, so I do have a morph suit, um, but you can just use a green file. So um, please use that trick. Um, so studio, the bit between those two photos was, was actually, I guess, the recognition that studio, as you've all worked out as well, but studio is a movable collective. Um, I was so um, thrilled to listen to the starting and ending of space um, as discussed by Joanne and Brooke before, um, and very much that sense that, um, that, you know, behind us all is, you know, the kind of the stuff of the house or children coming home from school. Um, but while we're all together, we are a studio while we're talking, I think. Um, but also group map I was using also for studio had the ability for a, sort of there to be a space um, that isn't just a critique wall, it's actually a collaborative space. Um, and the one time I think we had uh, essentially a different page every two weeks or three weeks, the students would start building against uh, to, next to their own names. So it was sort of like a, like a crit space, um, obviously when it's um, usable and movable rather than just screenshots, um, you can get, you know, drill down, there's content and information and um, images in all of these. Um, and so the students would use this all semester essentially as a kind of physical place. The, the one time I tried to move their names around, it was kind of weird. And it was like, no, but that's my place on that page. It's always there. Um, and that sense of adding things to each other, um, occasionally making comments on each other's work um, did, did occur. Um, but I just a really interesting kind of sense of being able to curate, obviously, their own work, um, but also to, um, to collaborate really and share and to see what each other's up to. You know, so-and-so did that model. I think we've all worked out the benefits of, you know, uploading before the studio and then the, the comparison that can happen um, much, much more easily, in fact, than um, on when it's on the screen. Um, these were the, I think a few of you have certainly seen these because these were posted to um, Facebook, but uh, it was about week eight. I'm not sure if all of you have the same, um, but that sense of, you know, maybe it's a bit of a slump in studio and they were doing and lots of other work so I said just bring along your um, you know your plans as they are um, and we'll just inhabit them so these were you know kind of um, housing for underserved communities in parts of the world and this is um, Osaka 
in the future with sea level rise. Anyway, so we were each person with a different pen colour and we were just inhabiting those spaces. We were doing um, things in those spaces. Each took about five minutes or so of kind of detailed drawing and then actually talking through some of those. Towards um, the end, I think this was me actually doing chin ups over here, um, but and we were all drawing kind of in silence and, and learning to inhabit spaces. So get up in the morning, which space are you sleeping in? Where are you going to? What are you doing? Um, some were, you know, more inventive than others. Someone conveniently brought a section um, and by then, you know, we had a storm coming in, tsunami, obviously sharks, um, algae that's being grown for seaweed. Um, but essentially that, that sense of how does this storytelling, how is storytelling part of inhabitation? Um, either as a part of that or, or really developing that sense of, of getting to know the, um, the, the sort of the space of the design was this, um, you know, the student, most of my students have submitted, as of yours, I know. Um, and, um, and here we have one of um, Finn Turley, who is just doing a remarkable inhabitation of space um, throughout his section, really enlivening, you know, the seaweed farming, um, the chat knocking on the toilet door. Uh, really, that's sort of, um, I think his, his storytelling is just exceptional as a second year, obviously. Um, and I think that's certainly something that I would continue into um, the future. And hopefully, if there is a second wave, um, let's hope for most of um, us all that there is, well, all of us all, there is no such thing, though, as Dr. Fauci says, we are still at the beginning. Um, and no doubt your universities, as mine as well, have um, asked us to prepare contingency plans if we do um, have to resume stricter social distancing measures. Um, and I think many of us will hold on to these positives, which have been about um, essentially the collegiality, here we have collegial help, um, but understanding that most of us will be delivering, I think, in a mixed mode or a multi-mode, and possibly that is much harder than what we've just been doing. Um, so at the bottom, I've got obviously, you know, the transition from face-to-face -to, -face to multi mode to online, online back to multi mode back to face-to-face. -to -face. So this is our um, help session that I'm sure you've all had as well. Um, our, my um, head of school, Pat Hislop, um, and obviously colleagues at home, um, and in space uh, just before we went into lockdown. So um, I think this will be the view of most of our classrooms, um, our teaching spaces over the next um, four or five months. Um, and hopefully towards 2021, it will be back um, mostly in person. But I think we are all benefiting from um, the collegiality that um, this place is, obviously the AASA webinars um, the most helpful community of practice, as well, um, the you know the fourteen thousand members of which I'm sure many of us are part of has just been um, absolutely one of the most remarkable places uh, in the world. So in the same way that we inhabit our students inhabit a movable collective with ourselves, I think we are inhabiting this um, collective with you know, fourteen thousand people. Um, I'm just hopefully just going to be able to pull this out for a moment and just in my last few minutes, um, but do a little bit of a, a move around of, um, sorry, let's move this guy out of the way, um, of the group map platform um, and just kind of looking through what's in there. This isn't necessarily arranged for a curated, um, I haven't moved anything around, changed anyone's colours. And as you can see on here, I mean, the type of things that, um, Certainly when we were uh, students or young undergraduates, um, the type of things we would name files, um, you know, Monday mornings, trying to explain footings to myself, um, as well, you know, obviously markups of things. So the, the sense that students can upload things to a, I guess, to a place, it, it locates it, um, it makes it public, it gives the sort of the rules of the space are, um, you know, are, are kind of pretty free, but there's a, a sense of being able to, um, yeah, I guess to explore each other's um, work and seeing where people are going. So I'm just going to probably try to get into a um, listing of things to do on particular days and times. So I'm just going to um, open one of these up and then they, you know, um, so I might not mean to have recorded that one. Um, then essentially being able to move through those. Um, just before signing off, I realise I'm going to be um, kicked off in a moment, um, but I did want to have a look through um, essentially the, the 4D learning environment. Um, and I think the suggestion, as I know UQ, um, particularly Christine Landoff at UQ through their, um, essentially their OLT grant that began these, um, the, essentially the open sourcing of these as a resource for the future. So if anyone is teaching technology in second semester this year, um, very much the understanding that these resources are um, you know, part of our, 
um, collective understanding. These are obviously, sorry, I realise this makes some people sick some of the time, um, but the, you know, the ability to um, scroll these as well, um, to look in at the health and channels, uh, to look in at obviously the fixings, the housings for the steel, um, and to see what's happening over time in those spaces. Um, has been remarkable for the students um, and it is a resource going on. So um, I think more things like this in our um, multi-modality, um, maybe we will wish for no second wave, um, but very much understanding that I think we will take some of these um, amazing innovations through. That's it from me, I'm um, stopping sharing. Looking forward to listening to, um, seeing noted in the questions, some of the innovations you've been using as well. Great. Thanks, Chris. Yep, thanks so much. Um, all right, so I might just ask our panelists to resume their, um, their microphones. Um, Mohammed, if you're listening in the background, I might just ask you to enable my video as well um, for the Q&A. Um, there we go. And yeah, we are back. All right, that was, um, that was fantastic and I almost don't know where to start with asking some questions. Um, one thing I should just mention to our audience of attendees as well is that even though this is the last scheduled AASA um, webinar, we are planning to have another event, um, hopefully in a couple weeks time. We're still letting out some of the details, um, but to have um, something more like a round table discussion um, that might involve heads of school and other program leaders. Um, I think really to, to try to get into this question of you know what's next and what are the kinds of things that we're um, returning to and um, or some of the new things that we're emerging towards um, perhaps as a way to uh, you know just host a, a different kind of conversation um, obviously on the back of the the presentations that we've had over the past um, five webinars so um, look I I mean I'm, I'm kind of you know fascinated really by some of the things that just came out from the, the presentation um, you know, just going back to the idea of pixelated institutional cyborgs um, or the idea of the, the, the domestic institutional, um, which is a fantastic, um, um, uh, I guess, commensuration of, of terms. Um, and also the, the green folder trick, Sophie, thanks for sharing that. Um, and also seeing tools like group map and so on. That's another one that um, I haven't come across. So, I mean, I guess one of the questions I would just ask is, um, I mean, a lot of these new tools seem like they're exposing new aptitudes um, of how people learn and, and perhaps have, you know, shown us, you know, different, um, let's say, tendencies that our students um, maybe have that we didn't quite, we, maybe we weren't aware of when we were teaching them face to face. Um, so it's exposed things that maybe were kind of latent and maybe by using different mediums, it's, it's really changed. Um, or it's facilitated you know, new ways of learning. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear some of our panelists maybe talk about um, how this, um, the, you know, the setting that we've been using um, has, you know, illuminated some of those changes. Um, and also then as we, as we move forward, um, you know, how do we maintain some of that? And I think, you know, part of the, the discussion here that came up from each of the three presentations is that going back to studio, in quotes, going back to studio is not necessarily something that we want to do. Um, returning back to, you know, you know how, how it used to be. It, it seems like we've all been exposed now to some real new opportunities. Um, and I think also it's, a, it's allowed us to ask some really serious questions about the things that we took for granted um, in that context. So I might just leave that as a, kind of a very open question, but uh, <laughs> invite, um, uh, the panelists to, to jump in on that. Absolutely. Uh, I, can, I can offer some yeah, thanks. partings. <laughs> uh, I think I'm finding, particularly with my negotiations, I'm teaching into both undergrad and the master's collective. And um, I'm finding that they're being a little bit more considered of the way they're curating their work. Um, in order to produce that. And Sophie, you're spatializing that by utilizing that online interface where you can actually trace and, and set up the orchestration of how to churn, um, turn out 
the composition of thought visually through that structure. I'm probably not being as methodological as that in studio, but I'm certainly getting students who are coming to me and understanding because we are removing that space, going back to that idea of the space time continuum, that they're actually being a little more considered about how they're utilizing their time with fervor. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying that the, the curatorial narratives that they're coming up are probably a little more considered than what I've realized in studio space. I can absolutely confirm that as well. Uh, from our experience at Curtin, we've been running the online studios for quite some time now. And the students' work is much more considered in that sense and, as you said, cur curated much more greatly in terms of what they present um, and how they package the project. So absolutely concur. I guess I uh, absolutely completely agree. I think also seeing for the first time, instead of, you know, the work is on the wall, look at each other's work, say something about it, you know, get up close to it that we've all said, I know all of us millions of times, um, but the, the immediacy of it, you know, in their room um, was, and, you know, there's nothing else to do. You may as well inhabit it, you know, um, was really fun, I think, for me, and I would take that forward, um, but not, not every session. I'm, you know, Certainly looking forward to real life. There's, um, there's something like I'd, I'd agree with that, these comments, but there's also something um, that I haven't quite put my finger on yet around issues of equity and access and um, how the setting that we're talking about illuminates things about um, about e access and equity and but also privilege, I think, and so. You know, it could be around bandwidth, but it could also be around the capacity of your mental health to um, to cope with the level of isolation and things like that. So, you know, as we're moving backwards and forwards between sort of a mixed mode back to online, if there are second waves or, you know, there's a diagnosis in the faculty or something like that, and then back again, I think that, you know, those, those shifts are going to become something that we have to consider um, a little more. And I don't think we've really got on top of that this semester. We're all just trying to help as much as we can, but really. a nuanced way of managing that, I think is still something we need to work on. And adding on to that, Jo, I think what's also um, coming out of going online is that we're having people who are possibly not as confident to speak in real space, finding their voice in virtual space and having that screen as a dialogue, which then gives them the confidence to be able to speak up more so. And I've had um, cases of specific students who uh, really struggle with giving presentations find their confidence through this medium. So it's almost like there are things that we've gained in this space and then when we revert back or having to translate back into a new concept of, um, of real space. And I possibly would like to look at Frosso's comment again. Sorry, Chris, to take over your role there. Um, but to, to really think about what are, what are some of the things that we'll not want to leave behind when we manoeuvre back into the studio. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, just scrolling back to see if we've got any other questions that have come up. We, we are over time at this stage. Um, I just wanted to, do any of our panelists have questions or comments for each other? anything that you're dying to find out about. Thank you for the beautiful feedback, um, especially to, to Frosso. When we throw ourselves out there with these strange ideas, it's really nice to, uh, to, um, to get feedback. And I've had a few messages from people too. So thank you to everyone for, for that. Yeah, indeed. I mean, this has been an amazing period to, to be able to, you know, there's never been so much sharing, um, I think, amongst our community in terms of seeing, you know, how, how do we go about our practice and, I think really, you know, understanding the things that we have in common and, you know, all the new sort of, you know, tools, techniques, um, and really this kind of, uh, yeah, connectedness and shared experience. Um, I mean, that, that online Facebook group also that you shared. So if I'm a member of that, you know, I've sure. enjoyed some of the banter and, you know, some of the resources that have come out of that. Um, you know, similarly, the, the ACSA in North America, um, back in May, we're running a number of um, sort of pivot conversations, which are also quite useful. Um, there have been podcasts and, and other things um, hosted by a variety of sources that have also been really fantastic um, over the past um, sort of weeks and months. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting times here. We, um, I mean, the, you know, the situation, I guess, is, um, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky 
uh, where we are here in Australia in, in relation to um, the intensity of the pandemic and, um, you know, just on the, you know, the back of news today that things, you know, at least us in, here in Queensland, I'm looking forward to the fact that our border is going to reopen now on the 10th of July and there's some certainty around that. Um, that's going to make life, uh, you know, a bit easier. Um, at my institution, actually, we're reopening our building to students um, next week on Monday. Um, not for teaching, but just so that they can inhabit their desk, you know, if they want to be able to work there or if they want to just have um, good Wi-Fi, you know, they now have a place where they can go and they can be a kind of a, a you know, Wi-Fi um, nomad um, and just to be able to get online and connect and so on. And I think also to have a little bit of um, interpersonal socialization with their peers um, face to face is probably going to be a welcome thing. So um, and, you know, similarly, you know, transitioning our, our workshop back to getting students to do a bit of hand assembly and things um, where it's safe and practical. So it's pretty, um, pretty interesting times. Um, so look, maybe we'll leave it there. We're, yeah, eight minutes past. So um, we had some fantastic um, presentations. Um, oh, maybe we've got a couple Q and A's that have come up. Yolanda from um, uh, South Africa asking, to what extent is the new multimodal mixed media helping perhaps to balance asymmetrical power relations in the studio? But does anybody want to field that question before we disband? <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd jump in on, on that one, um, if I could. And great to have questions from Yolanda. Um, look, this is something I, I tried to write about um, a while ago, actually. Uh, really noticing, um, and this is before all of this, but noticing that very quiet students in class, shy in class, as they're called students, w might be just like keyboard warriors on, um, on the group map platform, but which was wonderful because then the, you know, the kind of potentially louder, more privileged uh, students essentially typified were not, uh, were just kind of normal on, on the screen. So that, that's been one balance of power shift, um, but interested to, to locate more and hear from colleagues. My experience is that they tend to use the keyboards much more than actually interact in the visual or verbal discussions with their fellow colleagues. So that was the other kind of move to texting, if you like, as a way of responding. And also, uh, where we as faculty are no more prominent on the screen or, you know, we can drop out, our, our bandwidth can disappear and they can continue a conversation, we can come back to it, you know, there's, there's, um, it, it's it's never going to take it away entirely. Obviously, there's always this the kind of power relation of assessment and and us as those who impose that. But yeah, we are sort of smaller on the screen now. <laughs> True. Yeah, there's definitely been some uh, a certain amount of increased agency that the that the students I think have have felt um, and, and have acted on. Um, I my my bandwidth dropped out last week when I was teaching my subject and, you know, one of my students, you know, messaged me and said, Oh, Hey, well just, you know, shoot us your slides and we'll just talk about them until you come back. Um, you know, which ultimately I, I was able to kind of come back in a few minutes later. We didn't have to resort to that, but I just, I really appreciated that there was this kind of genuine, you know, everyone wants to just keep on going and, you know, make the best of this. And they weren't just going to use it as an excuse to kind of check out and disappear. Um, which interestingly, like, you know, if you take five minutes and say, hey, everybody go grab a coffee and then it turns into 30 minutes when you're in like a face-to-face -face studio, there's almost been more dedication and adherence. I've found at least so far in my teaching over the past few weeks um, in the online sessions, these kind of synchronous online sessions. So um, yeah, the particip participation has actually been um, fantastic. I've been really pleased um, with how it's been going. So yeah, hopefully we can maintain a lot of these uh, positive attributes as we move forward. All right, so with that, I think we will draw to a close. I, I wanna um, express my sincere thanks again to Sophie, Joe, um, Brooke, Francesco, and Tanya, and again, also to Mohammed. Um, and thanks very much to our attendees um, for showing up today um, from all over the place. Um, yeah, uh, we have people in from the UK, South Africa, Indonesia, um, all parts of Australia um, and New Zealand. Um, and probably others further afield. I'm just scrolling through the attendee list. So thanks very much, everybody. And again, just a reminder that um, do keep your eyes peeled for our, um, our forthcoming uh, sort of roundtable discussion that we're um, trying to orchestrate for a few weeks time. And, um, and thanks again for joining us um, over the past five um, 
uh, fortnights as we've held the AASA webinar series. So thanks again, and everybody have a good weekend. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much, Chris. Bye. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thanks, yep. bye. Bye. bye.